Hello dear brothers and sisters. Today as usual we will be talking about the Sunday Gospel that was read in the Orthodox Church and today's Gospel is a very short one but each line is very deep and each line could become a book if someone took the time and researched and did a study and meditation on each line. But before I go to the Gospel reading today, I would like to emphasize the fact that this Gospel was read this Sunday, falls between two major feast days, important feast days of the Church. Saturday before was the feast of birth of our beloved Mother of God, the Theotokos, and the following Friday, this coming Friday, we will be celebrating the elevation of the Holy Cross. Now, when I tell you about the Gospel, you will understand why those two feasts appropriately fell on each side of the Sunday, like book ends, and help us to understand the importance of this particular Gospel. The Gospel reading is from the John's Gospel, chapter 3, verses 13 to 21. No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. This is the first two, three verses that I read for you. And I will tell you the story of the birth of our beloved Theotokos and the elevation of the cross so that we will understand how important those two events were and how they are connected with these particular lines of the New Testament. Christ says that no one has descended from heaven but the Son of Man who has come to this world. And the birth of Our Lady Theotokos is very important because God prepared a mother for Christ in a very important and very special circumstances so that he will be born of a virgin, he will come into this world. And the fact that Christ talks about the Son of God who has come into the world, no one has ascended to the place where he was, except the one who has descended from that place, is the Son of God, the God Himself. We believe in Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God. And this is the dilemma for some people in their minds. How can Christians believe in the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and yet claim that they believe in one God? But God is one God and that one God is Holy Trinity. And the Son who has descended from heaven has come for our salvation. And the elevation of the cross is confirming the importance of the cross. And here in this Gospel we see that the cross of our Savior is compared to the pillar that was raised in the desert by Moses and those who were struck by the serpents, by the command of God, by lifting up the pillar, were rescued from the attack of the snakes. So this story is the pre-shadow, the precursor of the cross of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And in this gospel we see that whoever believes in Him, whoever believes in the person, who was hanging from the cross, the person who came into the world, who descended from the heaven, from the Father, came into this world to save us, is the one who will save us from the strikes of the snake. In this case, the snakes of the desert are also symbolic and they show us that our fight is not against the body and blood, as St. Paul says, but against the powers that are under the heaven, which is the evil spirits that lurk around us every second and tempt us and strike us like the snakes in the desert. We have that same image in the Garden of Eden, that the evil one presents itself 
in the form of a snake and seduces Eve and th through Eve also Adam and makes them to part from God, to separate themselves from God. And here we see that Christ is telling those who were surrounding him that the one who has descended from heaven has come to take those fallen humanity, the humanity that had been separated from God and unite them to himself so that they will restore the broken communion with God. Now here we see that the elevation of the cross is a later historical event, but by the elevation of the cross, later Christianity became dominant. This was an event that happened in the fourth century, the beginning of the fourth century, when Saint Helen, the mother of Constantine, the great Roman Emperor, went to find the lost cross of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And as she went into the surroundings of Jerusalem, she found in Golgotha that had become a garbage dump, and under that garbage, uh, by the help of some soldiers, they found the cross and they elevated it. Next week we will talk about it a little bit more in detail, how this event happened. But the fact that the cross of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was found and elevated, and that became a miraculous event in the life of the church that signifies how important uh, the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was. Because He, the unlimited God, entered into the limitation of humanity up to the point of entering into death, taking human sin on Himself so that He can embrace death the enemy of humanity and destroy death by his resurrection. So this was a very important event in the life of the universe, in the life of humanity, so that the incarnate Logos, the one who descended from heaven, will come and save humanity. And for God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life life. So the eternal life comes by the incarnation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And in this particular line, in this particular verse, we learn that it is the Father who sent Him into the world. As I have said in the past, there was a conversation before creation between the Father and the Son. And some of the Church Fathers mentioned this, and that's a revelation to humanity to, to show us that the Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, was ready to be incarnate before creation because by the wisdom of God, God knew that humanity will not last in communion with Him, but will fall from that communion, and that God Himself needed to restore humanity back to Himself. The incarnation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, as I said, is the beginning of the descent of God into humanity. And for that reason, God prepared a wonderful mother, the Lady Theotokos, whose icon you see displayed on the screen. Joachim and Anna were barren, and Saturday's hymns that were dedicated to Joachim and Anna tell us the story of their barrenness and the shame that they were encountering living in a society where being barren was considered a sin. And in this uh, particular story, we find that uh, Joachim and Anna go to the temple to worship God. And they were pushed away from the temple. They were pushed out of the line of the people who were waiting to enter into the temple to the end of the line. Perhaps even kicked out, uh, not being allowed to worship their God for one and one only reason that they did not have children. Now this shows us that the children were very important component of human life in uh, the ancient Israel. That having children and raising good children was very important in this society. 
but it also shows that the misunderstanding of the relationship of humans with God, that not having children is not a sign for anyone having no relationship with God, because we understand that sin is the broken relationship with God, that sinfulness is our separatedness from God, and that is not explained by having no children. And Anna and Joachim go into their home and they were very sad and they start mourning their loss. Now, besides the fact that they felt very sorry and sad that they did not have any offspring, now they also had to mourn the fact that they couldn't freely go into the temple and worship God. And in this mournful prayer, Anna and Joachim asked God for the reason, for the explanation why they had no children. And a beautiful story about Anna praying in the garden has also come to us through the tradition of the church, where Anna looks up to a tree where birds had little babies and asks God, why is it that she's not even regarded as those birds are? that she doesn't have the joy that even birds of the heaven do. And in this time, the angel of God appears to Anna and informs her that she will have a child whose name will be Mary, and she will be the mother of the Messiah, who is the light of the world. And so Christ here in this gospel is teaching his disciples that he is the Savior, who has come into the world, who has descended from the Father. And by saying this, he is clarifying for his disciples and for everyone else from that time until today that rightfully Mary is uh, deserving the title of Theodokos, which means the mother of God. Some movements of Christianity, that aspect has also is fading away, that the vener veneration and the respect that we have for the Mother of God is fading away because we try righteously concentrate on Christ only and we say that everything else doesn't matter. Of course everything matters because Mary was chosen like the prophets were chosen. If we have so much respect for the prophets who spoke the Word of God, how much more respect do we have to have for the Mother of God who actually gave birth to God physically? Christ our Lord became human through the Mother of God. And so the light came into the world as we know from our theology. And we will see here what Christ continues to tell. For God sent the Son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. So the incarnation of our uh, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is for one and only reason to save the humanity, be redemption for humanity. He who believes in him is not condemned. He who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Now, Sometimes we say, well, God is merciful and everybody will be saved regardless of our belief, what we believe and what we worship. That's correct to a degree. Yes, God is merciful. There is no end to God's mercy. But we also have to recognize the importance of our free will, the importance of our choice. Do we choose God? And it is very interesting here that Christ says, those who do not believe in the incarnate Logos, Son of God who has come into the world, they already are condemned. What does that mean? When we say salvation, we sometimes misunderstand and we think that we are captive and God is going to come and forcefully take us out of our captivity and place us somewhere else. That is not exactly how it works. We need to willingly choose God. We need to restore our relationship with God. And before the incarnation of 
Christ. We didn't know how could we do that. And God is, was a distant God somewhere unknown, somewhere in the universe. Now God becoming incarnate. In the message that the angel gives to the mother of God, we understand that God is with us because the angel says that the child will be called Emmanuel, which means God is with us. So God, by emptying himself from that limitless eternity, from that whatever God is in the outside of the universe, becoming human, God has put himself into the limitation so that he will be with us. So he has made that first step to be with us. Then he has taken the sins of humanity on himself and died on the cross. So that death, that is the wages of the sin, will be defeated. He has taken all of humanity's sin and dying once has cleansed us from that sin that will cause death. Now this time, this conversation happened because a certain Pharisee came to Christ named Nicodemus and started asking him questions. And first of all, Christ was surprised that Nicodemus did not know certain things that were very simple and very self-explanatory. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these things that you do unless God is with him. Now, in this first sentence, we understand already that Nicodemus had a misconception of who Christ is. And that is that he is explaining to Christ who he is, incorrectly calling him the teacher who has God with him. In the message that we receive from the archangel who appears to Mary, shows us that by the incarnation of Christ, it is us that is going to have God with us. In Nicodemus' understanding, it is Christ that has God with him. Instead of calling him, you are the incarnate God, you are the incarnate Logos. So Nicodemus from the very beginning has the misunderstanding of who Christ is. For no one can do these things unless God is with him. Instead of saying that no one can do these things unless he was God. Because we see that Christ heals such illnesses that were impossible for anyone to heal up to today, 2,000 years later, when the medicine has developed so much. There were uh, sicknesses that were healed by Christ that even today's nuclear science or nuclear medicine cannot even get close to healing. So that was a pure sign for all the Pharisees and for all of us that Christ was the incarnate God, that He was recreating people's eyes when they were blind from birth, that when people had been uh, sick for decades, by just simply touching Him were healed, that the, the person who was paralyzed by word alone was healed. And those were all the signs that Christ was not a person who was with God, or He was not a prophet who contained God's word, but He was God Himself who had come into this world. And that is why it is very important to know the circumstances where Our Lady Theodokos was born, that she was prepared from the very beginning. Even her parents were prepared from the very beginning to be giving birth to someone who will become the mother of God. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born anew, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. 
that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. The salvation is a new birth, that we are to be born to new parent, which is God Himself, that we are to choose to be born from the Spirit. And once we restore our relationship with God by the desire of our heart to have that relationship, God is not a person who gives us rewards for our good deeds. We don't do good things to receive a reward from God. The salvation is not something that we work to get as a reward. Salvation is here and now the ultimate desire of our heart to be in relationship with God. And that's what Christ talks about, that we here being born from the Spirit, first cleansed by the water from our sins and then born from the Spirit, we will restore our relationship with the Spirit, with God, with the Son of God. And in that relationship we will be saved. And salvation becomes a relational desire and desire to have relationship with God. And all the things that are separating us from God are removed by the grace of God, by the efforts that we have, and by two-way hard work, by the grace of God and by our work to remove those things that are obstacling us from our relationship, then that relationship is restored and that is what we understand as a salvation. For God sent the Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through Him, so that we will restore our relationship with Him, and by restoring our relationship with the Son, we are restoring our relationship with the Father. He who believes in Him is not condemned. He who does not believe is condemned already. Meaning that our salvation, again, is the relationship with Him. When we don't have the relationship with Christ, we already are condemned. There is nothing that God will do extra to make our lives miserable because we already have chosen to separate ourselves from God and our lives are miserable here and now and we are condemned that way by the choices that we make. And our salvation is simple to turn around and restart our relationship with God. And this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light. This is the importance of good deeds here. Those who do evil works, they are the ones who do not want to restore their relationship with God because God is light. And God reveals our evilness to ourselves. When we start our relationship with God, it sheds light on our soul. And there we only find undesirable things and therefore we separate ourselves again from God because we don't want those things to be revealed. And therefore, in order to understand the salvation, we need first to desire to have relationship with God and understand that the relationship is going to reveal our deeds. And the good deeds that we do is not for receiving a reward from God, but so that when the light is shed on our souls, we will see only good things about ourselves. That we will be self-confident to strive towards God even more, instead of being scared, ashamed of the deeds that we have in our heart and in our mind and in our soul, and hide from the light and be condemned into suffering. Dear brothers and sisters, we are run out of time and we will see you next time about the elevation of the cross. We will talk when we meet again. Thank you and I will see you next time.